Well, hello, guys. Welcome to the show. We are talking today with Lieutenant, retired Lieutenant Kevin Hallinan. We're talking about his book. It's called Over the Wall, From the Dangerous Streets of New York City Through the Birth of Counterterrorism and Beyond. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. How are you? Good. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm so glad to have you here. So your book sounds amazing because you have had such an incredible career. If you don't mind, I want to ask you first, um, tell me a little bit of your why, why you got involved in law enforcement. What was the draw for you those years back? Well, I, I guess it came originally from my parents. They were two Irish immigrants that met in the, the United States and my dad <clears throat> believed that uh, being a police officer was probably the next job to being uh, the mayor. So there was kind of a, a, a little bit of a push there. And I actually read a book. I worked for McGraw Hill when I came out of high school, a uh, publishing book company. And somebody left a book on my desk about a young police officer uh, at that time who had an amazing career. And that book uh, really kind of inspired me as well. That's awesome. Did you feel when you got involved now, you were talking New York City, so you were truly, truly in the thick of it. And, you know, that is a beast all of its own and completely unique to the experiences of uh, town policing. You know, I mean, just hugely just just that, for example, um, was it what you anticipated it would be like? Also, I tell you what, I, I guess I went in with my eyes closed. Of course, being from the Bronx, New York, I had some experience with the city, uh, but I really didn't know what, what, what was it going to take? Was I going to be good enough for it, for the challenges of the job? I spent seven years on the west side of Manhattan in a, an area that was just really great to break in because there were, there were the rich, <laughs> there were the poor, and, and there were the criminals. And uh, it kept, kept me really busy. And I guess I learned uh, how to react and how to work with people in many times crisis situations. And I had a partner, fortunately, during most of that time who was the same way as me. We wanted to make a difference. We wanted to feel that when the police arrived on the scene, whether it was an accident, someone had to go to the hospital, or in some cases, twice, to have a baby, I mean, there were meaningful experiences and, and there was really an appreciation of people when they understood that you cared about them and you were looking to help now obviously there were other situations where you had to take police action and be be quick but it was it was an unbelievable experience a very rewarding experience as i went through the the ranks of the nypd and uh, ran into a lot of difficult, uh, challenging situations. But as I look back, it was extremely rewarding and I'd do it again. That's incredible. Um, you must have had some really great instinctual understanding of how to navigate uh, that type of of work, of lifestyle, um, because of the experiences and the thing, the things that you see, the things that you have to deal with, um, you know, that we, we talk a lot about, uh, uh, compartmentalizing and all of those things were, were things like that. Like, you know, now we talk so much about, um, you know, mental health and, and protecting our peace and all of those things. Those were not conversations back in the day. Right. I mean, you just, you did your job and you dealt with it and that was it. Um, were, have you been on, or were you still on the job when, when all of this talk about um, protecting the mental health of law enforcement um, was even a conversation, or you were done before they even cared? <laughs> well, I guess Elsa, no, there were no conversations really at that time. But I believe that uh, me and my partner and others in, in the police department, there were some terrific men and women in the department who believed the same thing. To a certain degree, we were mental health. We came and, and tried to make a difference, try to decide whether they should be going to the hospital uh, uh, to get checked. And that and we were we were regulars at, at Roosevelt Hospital, and they had some great doctors and psychiatrists and people, and, and they would obviously make the final decision. But we just wanted to help uh, 
We didn't want to walk away from a situation that clearly was going to get worse. So it, with with that attitude, I, I, I think it helped us get through policing. Uh, and, and believe me, the sun didn't shine every day. Uh, there were times where we made mistakes, and but we learned from them and, and, and we grew. There was a lot of mentoring in the job at that time that really helped us grow. I love that. And, and I love your, your reasons for being a law enforcement officer and going in, in the direction that you did in life. And, you know, I talked to my husband who's also in law enforcement long time. And, uh, you know, I hear so many similarities there and it's the, the desire and need to help others and, um, through times of crisis and, and just be the good guys. Yeah. And I love, I love that, that, that just touches my heart so much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your career. Uh, your your career was incredible. What you start you started off as a beat cop, correct? And then you yes. rose through the yes. ranks. Um, so I have to I have to read a little bit here. So you rose through the NYPD ranks to command uh, America's first ever joint task force on terrorism uh, alongside the F FBI. Uh, tell me a little bit about that experience. That had to be just incredible. Well, you know, Elsa, it, it, what happened is I tell in the book about my experiences in the detective bureau and, and homicide with organized crime, all kinds of different uh, interactions. And when I got the call from the police commissioner one morning, I had to, I was a commander of the Manhattan robbery squad at that time. And he told me that uh, I was to report the next morning to, uh, FBI headquarters as the first commander of the joint FBI NYPD terrorist task force made up of agents and detectives. And, you know, I thought to myself when I hung up the phone, who am I? I mean, obviously I had a lot of investigations in, in, in many different areas of, of crime, but terrorism was just, I didn't even know there was a terrorist task force. Of course, they really had just started. But the first time that it really came home was on New Year's Eve, 1982, where I had just gone to a party up in uh, Rockland County, about 30 miles from the city, when I got a call that I had to get to uh, the city right away. There had been a bombing. And I remember going to the scene of the bombing. It was at police headquarters. And as I got out of my car and I saw all these flashing lights, etc. And I was getting briefed that there were police officers seriously injured uh, and uh, that there were a total of five bombs put around the city at, at, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, at the Task Force Office, uh, at police headquarters. And as I'm walking through this, I'm quite honestly <laughs> calling on the Lord to give me, give me courage and, and, and give me help because I, I considered myself almost inadequate to the task, but I got in there and I did the best I could. And again, with a lot of help from my friends, men and women, agents and detectives who realized that uh, I was a new guy on a block and they helped me get started. And it turned out almost a five year uh, career in the FBI with situations and, and terrorist groups that we worked on and the good news was by 1985, we had made over 100 arrests of domestic terrorists in not only in New York, but in other cities in the United States. And the good news was that there were other agencies, small department, large departments, uh, Secret Service, the Marshals, United States attorneys, district attorneys, everybody came together. And it actually was because of a a uh, robbery homicide up in Rockland County, two police officers and a Brink security guard were killed. And I think at that time, most police officers realized we all had a target on our back. It was at that time, six terrorist groups that were involved in that <clears throat> robbery homicide. And we had to, to investigate and were investigating nine separate groups at the same time. And the reason that, <clears throat> one of the reasons they were for, so effective they were very intelligent, very deliberate, and very committed. It was the Weathermen, it was the Black Liberation Army, it was the FALN, 
It was the United Freedom Front. Even the Jewish Defense League got involved in it. It was <clears throat> a very tight, organized group. And the reason was they did not want to have infiltration by law enforcement. So they kept their numbers small. And again, cellular structure, if you captured one of them, they didn't have enough information to give you if they wanted to, in most cases they never did, any who were the other people involved, what were the goals. What they did in Brinks in, Ro in Rockland County, they looked at that armored car robbery for three months. What they were about was target assessment. They would look not at one target, they'd look at four or five different targets and each one assess the value. How much would they get out of it? What would be the publicity? They were clear that New York was the place to do what you gotta do because of the media and the, the national, international coverage of what they did. Wow, uh, the scope and magnitude and the layers of everything that had to have been involved in, you know, just discovering all of these things is just mind blowing to me. And and you talk about this in the book, correct? Yes, that's in the book, right? Elsa, absolutely. I, I actually worked my way through it through, there were, were many, if you will, incidents and investigations, uh, both organized crime coming to me as a young detective with a very sensitive homicide case from Pleasant Avenue and were telling me, you're gonna make telephone numbers on this case. And of course, that was their exit uh, as they went out the door because all I told them was I wanted the two people responsible who I had identified into the station house, processed and down to court. I wanted none, nothing to do with any bribe money or anything else. I ended up in a homicide squad in the Bronx three different groups fighting for millions of dollars in, in drug money. I, my first day at reporting to the homicide squad and my Sunday go to meet and close, I almost didn't make it out in a situation in a hallway uh, in the South Bronx. So the stories leading up to what was unbelievable, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and of course, I also mentioned that I, I got drafted after giving a presentation on terrorism by Sports Illustrated to be their lead security chief for the 84 Olympics. And the wow. FBI director and the police commission said, if you don't go, we will. Wow. That led to the connection to Major League Baseball. Just my just mind blowing. I'm sitting here in such awe of you. And the most charming thing of all, sir, is that you're so humble. You're, you're so humble about it all. And, and your career is just beyond incredible, uh, your accomplishments. Um, so you retired from law enforcement and then you became the executive director of security. And I have to read it. I apologize. Of security and facilities management for Major League Baseball. What a crazy, wild jump that is from counterterrorism <laughs> to Major League Baseball. That's incredible. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit more about that story. Like when you, they, when you were approached for that, were you like, what? <laughs> also, I couldn't believe it. What happened was someone from Sports Illustrated, a ranking person apparently, heard they were looking for a security chief at baseball and called Sports Illustrated and said, hey, call Kevin and let him know we should throw his hat in the ring. Well, I did, but I was a lieutenant, a detective commander, if you will, but they were the head of agencies that were looking for that that job. I mean, it was a, a national job and, and uh, for me to get it, uh, it was a, a, a dream. Uh, I guess all my prayers were answered. But what was really important was when I am in baseball with all this background in terrorism and 9-11 happens. So uh, with all humility, I will say, I think I was in the right place at the right time 
because clearly my job was to secure and, and, and make sure that our fans were coming to 30 different stadiums and they were going to be safe and secure. And one of the things that I was really sensitive to was I didn't want to make these ball games security events. I wanted a baseball game, but yet I wanted to make sure we had done everything possible before the fans ever came into that ballpark that we had taken every precaution to make sure that they were going to be safe. And what was interesting about, again, 9-11, we didn't concentrate on just the stadium. We also looked circular at the area around the stadium, at, at if you will, the railroad tracks, the, the uh, chemical laboratory that was maybe a block or two away, because I knew of the planning of the adversary and what they would do. And I had to kind of think like them. And obviously, I wasn't by myself. Stadium operation directors, they, they fell right in with what we were looking to do. We worked closely with the FBI and with the task force and with law enforcement in each municipality. Very, very important because I had done one other thing shortly after joining baseball. I told baseball, right now, your security policy is reactive. It's got to be proactive. We've got to prevent. And what I wanted to do, and the baseball commissioner said, make it happen. I went to each city where we had a major league baseball team, met with the chief of police and told him I wanted the best police officer they had to work, an active police officer to work part-time as a security consultant with the local team. Not to do police, no conflict of interest, but to take care of baseball's rules and procedures and become an asset, a resource to the team. I got 30 of the best that I could find. And I tell you what, it, it wasn't uh, a lot of joy in baseball when I announced this program. I remember somebody in the back of the room yelling, we don't need a cop in our kitchen. <laughs> well, indeed they did, but... It took about certainly at least two years to build the relationship between these police officers who originally were coming to 30 games of an 81 game home schedule. That program was started in 1987. It's still in place today. And over a thousand police officers, by the way, Elsa, you like this. I got women involved in it as well. So it, it was a a team of people that have made a difference from baseball. And um, again, I'm so proud that it's still in place today. Uh, Kevin, you gave me chills when you brought up 9-11 and your role and the significance of you having been put in that position at that time when you were so needed to be there. And um it's just incredible to me and awe-inspiring. Um, let's talk a little bit about the book, because I know that's going to be in there. I know that's all in there. So I'm really excited to, to read more about it. Let's talk a little bit about the book, Over the Wall. Um, what made you decide? I'm going to take a guess that everybody you know has said to you at one point before writing this book that you have to write a book. A am I right? <laughs> You're absolutely right. And and, uh, and I just kind of blew it off. I didn't really think about it. But I think also what kind of pushed me in a direction, as you can see, I love the job. I, I love being of service and, and in a small way making it making a difference. But with all the, the negativity about policing these days, I, I really want to show those that are maybe thinking about it or even help inspire and, 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 and get people who are in the job to realize how important it is and really how rewarding it can be. And I think this book, by the way, and I should mention, uh, having a, a, a family and having a wife who believed in what I was doing and gave me all the support that I needed to continue because, as I used to say, I would leave my armor at the bridge. I didn't bring the stories home. Uh, I can remember some tough nights coming home and the house would be dark. And I had 
four children and I would go room to room looking at, you know, my children and thanking God that, that they, they were safe and taking an old toy away from, from some of them. Uh, but again, appreciative of what I had seen, you know, that, that afternoon and evening. And, and I was so fortunate to have a wife and a family uh, that was helping me get back out there tomorrow and do what I could to try and make things better on the other end. That is so beautiful, Kevin. And, you know, everything you said is so true and so right. The the significance and importance of having that support at home from your family, your spouse, your loved ones, and the appreciation for them for an understanding uh, for what you do and what you experience. It, it is invaluable. Um, you know, we advocate for that over here for law enforcement families to, you know, live the, the best lives possible and have the best supportive environment for our law enforcement officers. Um, so they can do exactly what you said, go out and do their job and come home, come home. That's our, you know, that's our number one goal for, for our loved ones in law enforcement, just come home. And, um, you know, we, and I can speak as a, as a law enforcement spouse that uh, we are so proud, so unbelievably proud of what our spouses do and who they are as human beings and, um, and for representing and, and to you, sir, specifically uh thank you for being everything what uh what the badge is supposed to represent and what what it what you're supposed to do so I, you know i personally thank you for that and uh extend my my gratitude for what you what you've done in your career it's just incredible and uh to your wife and your kids uh, i thank them as well for uh for being that support system so you could do what you do uh, it's just incredible to me, and it's it's truly my heart. I get I get emotional with it. So thank you very very much for that. Um, the book sounds just so truly truly amazing. Tell me a little bit about the writing process with that book. Um, was it easy? Was it challenging? Did it just flow? Because uh, it's different for everybody. Well, uh, Elsa, I guess uh, my uh, my children now adult children watching what I was up to, uh, I have to tell you that uh, I have two sons who are FBI agents. <laughs> I have a daughter who works with blind children. She's a visual rehabilitation specialist and another daughter who works with autistic children. So they're all involved in service because that's, that's really what it was about. And writing the book was, it turned out, ever actually much better than I thought, because as you will see in the book, I write a lot about the people that were difference makers who helped me and obviously helped the community by the way they conducted themselves both in, in uh, NYPD uh, and with the FBI. <clears throat> it was important that I bring credit to these people because they never got the credit they deserved. And they gave me uh, an opportunity. They mentored me <clears throat> and passed me on one to the other for greater challenges. And uh, I was able to contact them. I was able to interview them, if you will. And they were surprised. And unfortunately, uh, in life, some of them have passed on. <clears throat> and I'm actually this, <clears throat> this Thursday, going to the uh, <clears throat> 42nd anniversary of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and they're honoring uh, the original members, <clears throat> old guys like me, uh, at a, uh, a dinner reception in, in Brooklyn, of all places. And it's going to be a packed house, and it's going to be really special. But as important, uh, a number of the relatives, uh, wives, etc., are going to be there for that event. And uh, what I'm hoping to do is to get some time with them and talk about a little bit about their men, my mention of, of, of the uh, contributions that their husbands made uh, with the success of the task force. That's wonderful. That sounds like it's going to be such an amazing event. Um, 
I, you know, I sit here, I listen to all of this and I, and I think about, you know, when we talk about being retired for law enforcement, uh, there's really no such thing as retirement. Is there, there's no such thing. You're, you're, you're always, you know, even today you, you are always, uh, service is really in your blood. It's in your DNA. And, and clearly you pass that DNA onto your children. And, uh, that's just incredible. Uh, congrats to you and them for all the amazing things that they're doing. Uh, such a testament to upbringing and passing along those incredible values. And, uh, and they're going to be doing the same. They're going to pass that on to their kids too. So generations to come, uh, that's got to be such a great feeling for you, isn't it? Elsa, it is. And also, most importantly, with the book, part of the proceeds are going to go to PAPA. And PAPA is a police support group, independent of the police department. And it, PAPA standing for a police organization providing peer assistance to active and retired police officers that may be battling depression, possible suicide, uh, alcoholism. It was started in 94 95, uh, those two years, and it was because of 26 homicides uh, of mostly retired PD uh, who took their lives. And this this group, it's 200 active and retired. I've, th I'm serving my 15th year after I retired from baseball. As you said, I couldn't sit still. And I am, I've been working with Papa for the last 15 years. I'm on a a hotline every four or five weeks for 24 hours. And these calls that we get are just so rewarding. I meet with the person the next day and see, I'm, I'm really a bridge to resources. And everybody in PAPA, from psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, everybody is a volunteer. We're all volunteers. And it's an amazing organization actually being looked at by the military because it is success with bringing the homicide numbers down to the lowest number possible. So uh, Papa is going to get some of uh, the monies that would be raised by the book. So I'm really pleased about that as well. That is just incredible. Uh, so amazing and so awesome. What a terrific organization. Um, tell everybody where they can find your book. Are you, um, are you doing any like book signing events, any touring or anything like that right now? Uh, you know, uh, Elsa, I haven't. The radio shows have really been been the key. And of course, the family has been out there doing a little business. Uh, but uh, no, I haven't done any any book signings as, as yet. As yet. But uh, from what I hear from the publicist, that, that the radio shows really have have uh, gotten the interest in the book and the sales, and that's that that that's really helped. That's terrific. And tell everybody where they can find your book. Yes, Amazon, uh, Over the Wall, Kevin M. Hallinan. Make sure there's a couple of Over the Walls out there uh, from years back. But uh, yes, that Over the Wall, Amazon, uh, will get it to you the next day. I mean, they, they've been absolutely terrific in uh, in helping us. And uh, quite honestly, the, the word is, Elsa, and keep it to yourself, that if this book goes the publisher, uh, the publisher has said he'd like me to do a baseball book, which, again, is another positive story about a, a great game and great people. Yes. Oh, please do that. I have several people on my Christmas on my Christmas list and birthday list and all those things that I know will want that. I'm already getting your book for my husband, but don't tell him that's a secret. <laughs> I can't let him watch this show now. <laughs> I just gave away a, a, a gift. Yeah. No, this is um and, and I want to add to that that um this really is not just a book for those in law enforcement or going into law enforcement. This is really a book um that I wish the general population would read because I, I think, you know, getting those insights as to who you are as human beings um, and the hearts, you know, as we talk about the hearts behind the badges, uh, I, I think it's, uh, again, invaluable for people to get that relatability, that understanding of who you really are. And uh, so I want everybody to get this book. <laughs> Very bossy like that. Everyone get this book. <laughs> so uh, Kevin Hallinan, thank you again so much for coming on the show. Uh, it was a joy to have you on. And uh, when you write your next book, I would love for you to come back again. Can I, can I pin you down for that? <laughs> 
Yes, you got it. And, and uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much again. All right, guys, this has been the Elsa Kurt show. That was Kevin Hallinan. He's the author of Over the Wall. You need to go get that book over on Amazon right now. Take care, guys. Thank <laughs> you.